Hey, let's talk about the Reloom Site Builder marketing page, or rather, how I built the marketing page and designed it all within one week from beginning to end. Let's jump into that. Back in July, Dan and Adam, the founders of Reloom, wanted to work with me on a project that they had been building for quite some time. I had already done a video with Reloom styling where I took one nav component and I used three different mood boards to style it three different ways, and I participated in the Reloom rumble, so they kind of had a good idea of how I worked. You can see both of those videos in the description below. From those brief moments, we were as keen as the Aussies say to finally work on a page together that wasn't just for fun. So by mid-July, we had our first kickoff call and they gave me a preview link for what they were finally working on blocks, or as we now know it, site builder. They told me to play around with it, get used to it, and then they sent me a brief of some of the key points that they wanted to make on the marketing page and some of the ideas that they wanted to convey to their users. Immediately after reading this brief, I knew that the page would be fully interactive. What's a better way to learn than by actually using the product? So let's do a bento box style site where users can look around and they can click on different features without actually having to read anything at all. So here's what would come to influence the direction of the page based on our call. One, I wanted the page to be interactive. If you can understand how something works in a contained sandbox, you'll immediately know how it works without even reading a tutorial. As you can imagine, I was inspired by Linear and the Diagram site uh, that's done by Marco Cornaccio, who's a really talented designer and developer. Seriously, go check him out. So I wanted to prioritize fun. Sure, you can teach people how to do something on the internet, but nobody wants to read. Let's make people curious. If one thing is clickable, is it all clickable? Two, the copy needs to be clear and concise. Just like I mentioned before, no one's going to read most of it or any of it for that matter. Also, this needed to be all native web flow. I wanted the page to load fast and I wanted it to feel really smooth. The first thing I said to them on the call too was, uh, I have a wild idea. What if we did this in Framer? I'm only telling you this because I want you to know how the decision making process can go early on. Pie in the sky type of thing, you know? They decided that it would still be a Webflow site so that they could keep it within their ecosystem, keep using the same structure that they have set up, and they didn't want to deal with a lot of subdomain stuff. Totally understandable. After the kickoff stuff, we started in the low fidelity phase, just like I start every project. Because they already had all of the key features, all I had to do was write the copy and create the UI that would tie into that. Let's take a look at how I set this up. Starting from the top, we saved the hero for last because we didn't know exactly what it was going to look like yet. The only thing we knew was that we wanted people coming to the site to get into the product right away. It's important to set your ego aside when you're working with a company that both needs to make money and also needs to make a good product for their users. You might have the coolest ideas in the world, but if you can get your users into the product earlier and faster, I'd consider that a greater success. So we came up with the idea to let people generate ideas above the fold. You'll also notice that to the right, I have a few copy variations of the hero that didn't make the cut. Every time I worked with someone that writes copy, I usually end up seeing the copy in Google Docs and never in its real world setting. So when I write copy, because I know Figma and Webflow, I like to create real world alternates so that I can see what they'd really look like on the page. You probably noticed when I was zoomed out how messy this was. This isn't even real structure. This is me categorizing the key features into multiple sections. Every page needs a solid H1, H2, and H3 structure. And this is my approach to that. Will the entire design be literally vertical? No, no, no. But it's important to not get attached to ideas and make sure the end result is better than your ego. There's also zero UI here, minus the hero, which ironically is the last thing on our mind. Content first, remember that, okay? Do it content first. The content should inform the design, not the other way around. This lets us move fast and drop ideas if they're not working. Once we locked in the copy, I started making the UI prototypes and they're pretty simple, right? I tell people often that prototypes really only need to go as far as selling the idea. And this is what I'm doing with these illustrations. They're basic, they're black and white, and the states live just off the frame to the left and the right. I don't generate every single state, just enough to convey the idea of what I want to accomplish. And on that note, know your audience. Adam and Dan are both capable designers, and they don't need their handheld when pitching them. But if your client has never seen a prototype before, or they've never even heard of Figma, you might need to go a bit further. Just 
Stay away from the Figma prototype spaghetti. We ended up dropping a few ideas on the way from low fidelity to high fidelity because we felt that the designs were more fun than they were helpful in actually understanding the product. Even if you did have a good time clicking around, it's best to keep the page short and sweet. Like I said, content first, design second. I want to talk about copy for just a moment and I promise this will be worth it. If you look at the current site, and even in my earliest iterations, the headlines are short, and the subheaders are kept to one sentence, max. Two if it's more like a one-two punch. I was a product designer for 10 years before web design, and if there's one thing I learned from working with millions of users, it's this. People don't read. So here are some tips that I use to write my copy. Your H1 should be incredible. Most people will only see that one thing, so make it worth the bandwidth. You only get one shot. Write your headline so that if people only read the H2s, that's good enough. Get the information in there as best as you can. If they want to read the subheadlines, they know how, but the H2s have to make them curious. Write multiple variations. Don't just refine one, okay? And next time you're struggling to write really clever copy, Try these three small techniques. One, alliteration, a sentence with the same sounds. You know, every word has the same first letter. Number two, rhyming. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. I don't have to explain that one. We know what it is. I hope I don't have to explain that one. Three, tweaking phrases. Take a popular phrase and just twist it a little bit. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. That's a phrase. I didn't twist it, but you know. Let's move on to the high fidelity stuff. Because I had everything ready to go from the low fidelity phase and I wasn't waiting on any content because I wrote it, we were ready to start immediately. So I do what I always did. I start by creating shared colors and text styles to save time in case we need to make sweeping color and text changes. Remember, this is a product that was still technically in beta, so things were changing constantly in minor ways. That's another excuse for going fully Webflow native. No need to re-upload illustrations because it's all Webflow native. If I need to change a color, it's already tied to one shared color. Then I laid out everything using auto layout to give myself a space constraint. Constraints are good. I need all of my stuff to fit into specific boxes and within a certain grid. I know a lot of people that aren't fans of using auto layout and they find that it slows them down. And if that's how you feel, that's fine. I totally get it. But for me, auto layout is my jam. Inject it into my brain, dude. The important part about using auto layout in my designs is that I know for certain I'll be able to build it quickly, easily, and I won't have a layout where I'll have to figure out how I'm gonna hack it together. Earlier, when I said I wanted the site to be playful, one of the ways that I did that was by exaggerating the UI. The Reloom team was very receptive to the idea of having some parts of the UI larger than the others, with the sole means of showing off what their product can do. In some instances, we take two parts of the UI that are completely separate from one another, and we bring them together so that you can see how they affect each other. In every example, I've used some form of exaggeration mixed with the real thing. So I took screenshots from the UI, trimmed them into the pieces that I needed, scaled them down into the constraints that I had, and then I recreated them in Figma followed by Webflow. If the recreation felt too small or too large, I would tweak it a little bit. Take, for example, some of the buttons. I made some of them purple where the real counterparts are white or black. I needed you to know what the most clickable thing was, even if it meant inaccuracy to the real product. That's exaggeration. Now, when it came to construction, this was both the easiest and the hardest part. Easiest because the team duplicated the entire site to give to me. All I had to do was remove some of the pages that I didn't need and reuse the styles that they already had in place from their current website. The hardest because I had 11 100% fully custom and native examples that all needed to be animated and scaled from desktop to tablet to mobile. Yeah, AKA classes out the asses. That's rhyming, write that down. So let's take a look at one of the interaction classes. I'm using FinSuite's client first approach as best as I can here. The features are complex and sometimes the system fails me, but I tried my best. Breaking this down, I keep the name as builder to keep the class as far from the original Reloom website as possible. If they ever decide to ditch this page, the classes won't affect any other pages. It's like a self-contained box that we can crush at any time. Then I name it by what feature number it is so that it's easy to keep track of which one I'm animating. After that, I try to keep things more contextual like left or right, top or bottom, buttons are buttons, and text is text. If it belongs to a parent, it's in the class. Keeps things from getting too hectic. The reason I need complex classes is for responsiveness. If this entire thing needs to break down from desktop to tablet to mobile, I need to make sure that I don't break any of Reloom's current website classes 
and I need to scale things on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, let's check out some interactions. While most of the animations were rather simple and that they're just overflow tricks, one of my favorite hacks are the buttons with more than two animations tied to them. In Webflow, click interactions are tied to just two clicks max. If you click once, thing happens. If you click again, thing two happens. That's all you get. But in the moments where I needed three clicks, like in the generate sitemap feature, I did a little magic sleight of hand. After you click twice, the original button is set to display none and disappears altogether. In the exact same position, there's a duplicate of that button with slightly modified interactions that does what the original button does with new transforms. When that's clicked, the entire thing is reset and goes back to the original button. Not only is this a performant approach, it lets me use interactions all natively. If the team wants to go back and modify it, there's no code involved, so anyone can modify this. Plus, there's two small Easter eggs on the site. One of them is a reference to my own work, and the other is a small interaction that's actually real. It does a real thing. I hope you enjoyed watching the breakdown of the site as much as I enjoyed making it. I want to give a special thanks to Dan and Adam for choosing to work with me. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with them. I would do it again. In fact, I'm doing it right now as you're watching this video. And a huge shout out to the Rayloom team for creating the Site Builder product. It's amazing. If you haven't tried yet, go check it out. It's in the description. You're going to love it. I recently worked on a client project where I managed to crush five days down into about six hours of work just using Site Builder. Yeah, it's that good. It's amazing. Go try it yourself. Uh, link in the description. And let us know what you end up using Site Builder for. We'd love to see. So write us in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell, baby. Until next time, see ya. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Oh, sorry. I'm toasty.